Dr. S. Piersa from Mechanical and Industrial Department, IIT Roorkee. I am going to deliver my lecture last, you see the number 40 and you see now our journey is going to be end of the course of the strength, uh, this strength of materials and this course is developed under the national programs on technological enhanced learning. So, you see in this lecture we would def definitely brief it out about uh, the Castiglino's theorems which we discussed you see you know, like in the last uh, term. Also, we were trying to solve some of the numerical problems and then you see we would like to conclude whole you know like the course that what we have discussed entire in entire 39 lectures and you see what exactly the importance and the applications of these uh, you know like uh, different uh, segments of the strength of materials in our future courses. So, uh, prior to start the next lecture you see this lecture we would like to discuss about you know like briefly that uh, because you see in this lecture we are basically we are going to solve the numerical problems. So, our main intention is first to uh, discuss about you know like what we have discussed about the Castiglino's theorems and all that part strain energy part. So, we started the last lecture with the one of the basic form of the strain energy that the strain energy due to the bending action. And we found that you see if we want to calculate the strain energy under the bending action then always you see we need to segregate those segments where the load conditions are there. So, you see here we, we, we have taken you see you know like uh, the simple simply supported beam and the point load is there somewhere distance you see from A from point uh, this left end and we found that you see we need to segregate as I told you that there are two reasons one is for A one is for B. And uh, within that A reason, if we are saying that the M1 is, uh, you know, like uh, the bending moment is the, um, bending moment is there due to the action of load, then the strain energy can be easily form uh, formulated as U is equals to uh, this uh, within, you know, like the volumetric domain integration of uh, m square divided by 2 Ei into dV. And for another section also, we can calculate the same strain energy, and then you see we can simply sum up uh, algebraically those strain energy components U1 plus U2. So, you see this is the one of the basic form you know like through which we can simply calculate that if you see the deflections are there under the bending action then what will be the strain energy that means how much energy can be absorbed under the action of bending moment. So, that can be calculated and also we can calculate you see that okay within the elastic region what exactly the value of those things through which we can say that yeah this is under the bending action we have this much strain energy or this much energy can be absorbed by the material when it is subjected by a bending action. So, that what you that is what you see we discussed in the first uh, segment of our last lecture. And the, then you see we discussed about you know like uh, then if we have the number of different loads then you see there are two different forms of you know like the energy is there it depends on which domain which we are talking. So, if you are talking about the normal domain like you see here in the stress strain diagram if domain is there that means you see the basis is there of the strain then you see the area under the elastic curve. Uh, within that particular domain of a strain will give the, uh, this elastic strain energy. But if, if we change the domain then you, that means you see if you are talking about you know like uh, the area under the curve in which the base is there where the st stress is there then this energy is known as the complementary strain energy. So, complementary strain energy can be easily calculated that, that is you see generally we are termed as the U star is being calculated by half of integration of uh, epsilon x into uh, the differentiate term of d into sigma x. That means you see here we are simply checking the variation of the stress components and the corresponding strains are there. So, whatever the mag this multiplication divided by half is there will give you the complementary, st complementary strain energy. So, now you see with the changing of the domain we could easily figure out that uh, what the exact things are there with the complementary uh, strain energy and the elastic strain energy. And we also found that when we are talking about uh, uh, the linear reason then you see we have you know like the complementary strain energy and the elastic energy have the same value and they have the same significance also. But if we go beyond that, that means you see after the yield point we have the nonlinear reason where the stress is not uh, directly proportional to the strain. Then we will find that you see that uh, the uh, complementary strain energy and the elastic energy uh, this strain energy is somewhat different because you see here in that uh, which domain is providing what kind of in, uh, deformation corresponding use the changes are there in the elastic strain energy and the complementary strain energy. And then in the last segment of that we discussed about the Castiglino's theorem that you see when a uh, number of externally applied loads are there then how we could figure out because you see when the, the, there are many points where you see uh, the load application is there then the deflection at those points are nothing but equals to the change of strain energy uh, per unit you see uh, divided by the change of uh, uh, load is there. So, del u divided by del pi will give you the deflection at those points. 
So this is the first theorem of the Castig Llanos, or we can say in other terms also that the load at different points can be easily calculated by del u divided by del di. That means you see here the change in the strain energy within the within the domain of the change of displacement will give you the load at these points when the load application and when the deformation is there towards the direction of the load. So this is you see in any of the way you see we can simply define the Castig Llanos first theorem. And then you see we also we could also figure out that if the bending action is there that means you see the moment is being applied on an object then also we could simply figure out that how the what the angular rotation is there based on the strain energy. So Castig Llanos set up one more relation is there that del u divided by del m i at various location m i means the ith point is there. So del u divided by del m i will give you the theta that means the angular rotations at this point. So also we can say that whatever the angular rotations are there within the uh, you know like uh, this domain of uh, any part then strain energy within the domain of this angular rotation will give you the moments at those points when the angular rotation of the uh, this object is there within the direction of the bending moment. So these uh, relations are being set up in the previous part and that is what you see now with those relations in this, in this lecture particular we are going to you know like uh, use those relations and trying to you know like uh, uh, solve the numerical problems. So we, we, are, we, are, uh, we are going to take the two numerical problems based on that so that uh, we can clear, clearly see that the difference of uh, the uh, this uh, castig leno theorem applications uh, with the other term. So here you see in this uh, the last lecture we have some of the numerical problems based on the castig leno's theorem. So the question number 1, we have you see the cantilever beam in which you see the first one end is rigidly fixed, uh, fixed up and other end is free and the you know like in this, uh, ca this cantilever beam CD which has a, you know like uh, supports a uniformly distributed load UDL is there with the uh, intensity of W and a concentrated load P is there at the free end. So you see here this simply uh, this uh, simply cantilever beam is uh, you know like acted by two main loads one is the udl with the intensity of uh, load intensity of w and the p is there that is the point load at the extreme end now you see there are the numerical problems are given the total length of the beam is l which is 3 meter the intensity of uh, the udl is given as 6 kN per meter and the load application the point load at the free end which is there at the, you know like the 3 meter is 6 kN and you see we have the flexural rigidity EI is also given as 5 mega Newton meter square. We need to find it out the deflection at point D. That means you see you know, like at the extreme corner where you see the combined load action is there the UDL as well as the point load what will be the deflection is there at point D. So let us say if you are assuming that the deflection is there Y0 at point D when the load P is applied. So obviously you see when only P load is there the direct load is there we can simply get you know like uh, the deflection at this point since P is acted vertically uh, you know like uh, vertical and directed downward directions D then it can be simply you know like represented by a vertical deflection and a position towards the downward. So we have you see the delta 0 means you see du by dpi. So we know that actually the Castiglino's first theorem says that you can simply get the, diffract, uh, the deflection in the load direction. Uh, when it is equal to du by dpi. So the uh, deflection and the load direction has to be in the same direction. So in our case also you see the deflection is there in the downward direction and the load is also applied towards the downward direction. So we could simply figure out this thing. So this theorem is well applicable. So you see delta 0 which is equals to du by dpi which is equals to 0 to L the total, uh, total entire length of the beam into now you see since uh, the UDL is there so we need to apply the bending moment so M, M, or M divided by EI into DM by DP into DX. So now you see the bending moment as I told you, you know, like it is, it is there and it is due to the uh, presence of uh, this UDL is there. So that's what and uh, this uh, point load is there because you see one end is fixed and one end is you know like uh, loaded by point load. So obviously you see the moment will be there towards the downward direction. So bending moment has to be calculated here. So bending moment m at a distance of x from d you see from the fixed end. So you see we have m is equals to minus because it is going in a downward direction towards this particular uh, direction. So we have minus p of p into x because of the point load and because of uh, the in load intensity w udl we have half of w into x square. 
So this is the total algebraic sum of these, uh, you know, like uh, the bending moment because you see both are the responsible load is there for any kind of bending action on that particular beam. Now, and it's, you know, like uh, derivative with respect to P is obviously, you know, like with the Castiglione's theorem, dm over dp is equals to minus x. So, you see here with those equations now, we can simply, you know, like uh, substitute uh, the, uh, for this particular value of m and then you see dm by dp will simply, as I told you, give you the minus x. So, we have y0, which is the deflection part is there, is equals to 1 by ei integral 0 to l and you see that the total moment was px plus half of wx square. So, you see with the integration and keeping the value of L here, we have the y0 value is equals to 1 by ei pl cube by 3 plus wl square by 8. So, now you see we have all those values means we have the value of point load, we have the value of total beam length that is 3 meter, we have the value of load intensity w and we have the value of flexural rigidity. So, by keeping all those values in this particular y0, we have you see 1 by 5 into 10 to the power uh, 6 is uh, and then in the bracket it is 8 into 3 to the power square because you see 3 uh, meter is given as uh, the length. So, you see here. <coughs> we have 3 square into 10 to the power cube because it was in the meter part. So, you see we need to convert it into that part divided by 3 plus 6 into 10 to the power cube into 3 to the power 4 because you see you know like uh, this is there divided by 8. After considering those things here, now we have y0 which is equals to 26.55 into 10 to the power uh, minus 3 meter or we can say that uh, it is the y0 which is the initial deflection uh, due to the load application is 26.55 millimeter. So, in this question, the key phenomena is when you see when a beam is there and it is being subjected by UDL as well as the point load, then you see it is very hard to calculate the deflection with the using of a standard phenomena because again you see we need to consider you know like the direct integration method and go like that. But here it is straight uh, theorem is there that uh, when the load application is there, then use the Castiglione's theorem that you see the delta i is nothing but equals to del u by del p i because you see the two different kind of loads are there. So, just consider the loads with the kind of moment and then you see you can simply calculate. So, the real good feature of this Cashel Lino theorem uh, says that if you have the number of loads on a, a, a simple structure, then it is pretty easy to calculate if you can simply figure out the strain energy. So, strain energy divided by the number of load, the div, uh, this differentiation will give you the deflection at those points only the condition is that the deflection and the load application is having the same direction. Like you see in this case, uh, we apply the load by UDL or the point load, they are simply acted toward the downward direction and you see the deflection was also there toward the downward direction. So, with that consideration, you see we simply apply the y0 uh, formula here by 1 by ei into you see the px is there to the point load and wx square by 2 was there due to the uh, bending moment and with the inclusion of both the things, uh, we will have a clear feeling about that uh, since both are the responsible, uh, you know like the parameters are there for having bending moment. So, y0 can be easily evaluated. So, this is you see the y0 part was there in a simple case of a cantilever beam where UDL and the point load was acted. Now, we are taking the question 2 you see for a simple truss problem is there. So, when we have a truss as shown in this particular figure in front of you, now we need to find out the vertical deflection at point C. The point C is the intermediate point is there. If you see that uh, truss, then we have two rigid, uh, two rigid points are there and these rigid points are simply shown by A and point B. So, you see here, these points are being rigidly shown up and then you see there is a direct link is there with the uh, distance A from A is there that is point C and you see from point A1 also we have the distance of point B. And then you see we have the uh, linear, you know, like the distance is there in the truss problem in, you know, like from A to C that is 0.6 meter. And from point C to the free end, we have, you see, the A1 distance is there which is equals to 1.5 meter. And the vertical distances where the two fixed rigid points are there is 0.8 meter. 
Now in this truss problem you see you know like we have the different coefficients a1 and a2s are there and you see you know like uh, uh, we have given that a1, a2 are the area for different different segments. So we will find that many of the you know like the trusses have the similar kind of area somewhat you see you know like uh, when the longer length is there we need somewhat more area you know like the means the cross sectional area of the uh, uh, this trusses so that it can withstand some of the good load conditions. So you can see that uh, when the base is there, when this particular base is there, we have A2 area. This base, this diagonal part is there. This is also having the A2 area. While somewhat you see, you know, like these things are, are having the A1 area. And at point E, which is the free point, uh, we, we have a point load of having uh, intensity of uh, 60 kilo newton at point E. So now in that you see we have the area A1 which is you see like AB part, AC part and AD part and the CE part is nothing but equals to 500 millimeter square while BD and DE part will be nothing but equals to <clears throat> this uh, 1000 millimeter square area is. So after knowing uh, the distances and the area. Now our main intention to find it out the vertical deflection at particular point C which is the intermediate point is there. So now you see in the particular solution part since there is no vertical load is applied at uh, point C because you see our main intention is to find out the deflection but there is no load direct load application is there. So we, may, we, we have to introduce a dummy load is there of load Q at point C. So you can see in the particular figure that you see these are you know like the A and B are the rigid points where there is uh, we cannot apply any load but our main intention is to find it out the deflection part uh, at this particular point C. So as per the Castiglione's theorem there should be an, a load application is there then there is a direct link is there with the deflection part. So there is an you know like the dummy load is being applied here at point C and as you can see that point E we have a vertical load is there already P which has you know like the magnitude 60 kilo Newton is there and these are all the other, other intermediate points are there. So now within this particular truss structure we need to use the Castiglione's theorems and uh, we, we need to denote you see you know like all those forces like uh, force F1 is there in the given membrane, membrane where you see you know like uh, there are lots of uh, different uh, in, uh, this, uh, uh, locations are there through which we can say that the load application direct or indirectly applied. So we, we simply you know like uh, apply the combined loading of P and Q you see here and we, we, we just want to see that actually what the other impacts are there of these loads at these, these other points. So with that now we have the deflection at point C because that is our main concern is equals to summation of Fi into uh, uh, this Fi Li divided by Ai into E then you see you know, like what exactly the, uh, this uh, domain change is there so del F by del Q because you see this is the dummy load so what the real uh, relation is there with the force to the Q. And then we know that since it is a constant uh, material term is there so we have 1 by E can be taken out as a constant then you see it is the integration or the summation of uh, Fi Li by Ai because you see at different different locations it is there into Df by Dq. So this is our the first basic equation by introducing the dummy load at point C we could easily figure out that the deflection at point C because the Castiglione says that if we have a different uh, load location is there then it is pretty easy to calculate you know like uh, the deflection at those points uh, if uh, the direction of uh, load and the deflection is in the same direction. So you see with the, that concept uh, we simply write this particular equation. So with that free body diagram now if you see that uh, we what we have simply you know like uh, we have the uh, load application is there at uh, point E and this load is being uh, and uh, at point C and this load is being shared at uh, uh, point A and point D. So you see here this is a perfect square is there and that you see you know, like if you, are, if you are writing this then we have you see the uh, this uh, base and the hypotenuse is like that and the <coughs> this uh, uh, length is there of 4 so 3 to 4 with that you see we can simply segregate the force component towards the outward direction as you see when you apply the load it will give direct impact to the fixed points. So at the fixed points A and B we have you see the 3 fourth of Q of this particular load dummy load and 3 fourth of Q is being uh, uh, carried out by point D because of this location and then you see some of the load is there also on the top, for, uh, top of direction at point A. So with this particular free body diagram now we have a real feeling that when you apply the load at point E and point C then you see this load is being simply you know like absorbed by some of the joint points and these joint points are you see we can see that the 75% of the load is being you know like coming at that particular rigid link. 
So now you see with these forces in the membranes, now if you are considering the sequence, the equilibrium of the point, you know, like at the joints E, C, B and D, we can simply, you know, like miss all those equilibrium points at either the point E or we can say a point C or we can say a point B and D. At these particular, you know, like positions where we, we are saying that the statically equilibrium positions are there, with that we may simply determine the forces in each of the membrane by simply, you know, like applying the load Q. Because you see the load Q is a real, uh, though it is a dummy load, but it, it has a real feeling about those things that you see, it will simply cause that kind of de uh, de uh, deformation or the deflection at these joint points. So if you are talking about the joint, uh, joint E, which is you see you know, like uh, these things are there, then we can say that the force uh, uh, which is coming from C to E is always 0, uh, which is equals to force coming out from D to E. Because you see it is the statically equilibrium point is there and if you are talking about point C which is you see you know, like the intermediate point is there, the force which is coming from A to C like this one and you see in the horizontal way because you see all those things are coming in the vertical part you see here and then you see the force which is coming so it is equals to 0 A to C but the force which is coming from C to D. That means you see you know, like in the uh, vertical downward direction since it is a dummy load is applied towards that part so we have you see since it is coming from that part so we have minus Q. And if you are talking about point uh, joint D which is you see you know, like uh, the kind of rigid joint is there there is no force can be transferred from A to B because you see they are rigidly uh, linked to one of the uh, joints so we can say that F A to B is equals to 0. But if you are talking about the relative force terms between B and D, that means you see in the horizontal way, we know that this, this clear transformation is there of minus 3 fourth of Q. Because you see, you know, like it is a transformation is there of the particular force. So now you see we have all those forces you see at the different different locations which are coming, you know, like causing from these things. So the total force in each of the member under the combined load action of Q and P can be also you see uh, shown here that you see F C to D is there which is Q and F A to D is there which is the 5 by 4 because 3 fourth is there so hypotenuse is 4 so with the taking of that particular triangular element we have F A to D which is you know like towards the uh, diagonal part is there 5 by 4 Q and towards this direction you see the horizontal direction which we discussed you see B to D transformation is there that is 3 fourth of Q. So with that particular triangle now we can simply get the forces at individual membrane. So now you see and then also we can once you have the forces then we can simply you know like relate those forces with the dummy forces del F by del Q and once you have these things then you can simply figure out that what exactly the uh, you know like the corresponding length and the area is there. So what exactly the strain energy formation is there in these terms. So if you are talking about the uh, length AB that means you see you know like uh, the two rigid links was there you see there is no force transformation is there in that term. So you see here obviously this uh, force divided by del Q is 0 since it has the distance of 0.8 meter and if we have you see the area which is 500 you see 5000 to 10 to the power minus 6 meter square. So you see since uh, there is no contribution is there because of the force applied is 0 there is no contribution in the strain energy term. And if you are talking about A to C means you see where the dummy load is acting at C and A is rigid link. <coughs> Again you see here since the force transmission is there from 15, P, uh, 15 by 8 P but you see here that since the, uh, this dummy load is acted on that point so del F by del Q is 0. So we can say that uh, there is no contribution is there from this end. And since you see the distances is already given as 0.6 meter so obviously the area will come like that but uh, since you know like uh, this del F by del Q component is 0 so obviously it will uh, have again the same similar kind of things are there no contribution in the strain energy formation. Now come to the A to D form you see the diagonal form is there. Obviously you see you know like the straight uh, <coughs> transformation is there as you can see this particular part. So what we have we have 5 by 4 uh, into P is there plus 5 by 4 into Q is there. So the DF by DQ if we are simply taking DF by DQ we have the 5 by 4 straight component is there and you see you can simply get that particular length is there by 1 and then you see the area can be easily figured out that 5000 into 10 to the power minus 6. So after doing all those components what we have we have you see you know like the strain energy because of the P load and because of the Q load so we have you see 3125P plus 3125Q. 
So you see here, this is the real, you know, like uh, the intermediate link is there through which the force transmission is there and through which you see we can say that the strain energy contribution is there. Now if you are talking about the BD link, BD is the bottom link is there. So we know that you see through which there is a force transmission is there. So we can say that it is um, um, uh, minus 21 by 8 P is there and minus 3 fourth of Q is there because of this force transmission. So after having these things, if you differentiate out these terms, then we have minus 3 by 4 because it is a Q function is there. So we can say that, you know, like uh, there is a kind of contribution is there of this. And then you see, once we know that 0.6, uh, you know, like uh, uh, this uh, meter distance is there. So we can also calculate the area that is 1000 to 10 to the power minus 6. And we can say that it is 1181P plus 338Q is there in that particular strain energy uh, uh, contribution because of these terms. Now, if you are talking about the CD, which is the straight part is there, you know, like at C, we are applying the load and D part is there. Since, you know, like uh, the uh, force uh, part is there as a minus Q because straight away we are applying the load towards the vertical directions. So, this minus Q, so we have this del F by del Q is minus 1. We know the distance of 0.8. We have the area. So, we can simply say that it is plus 800 Q. And then you see we are talking about CE which is you know like uh, the <coughs> straight part is there of this. So in that we can say that the 15 by 8 P is the force ap application is there. There is no Q part is there. So DF by DQ is 0. Once it is 0. So there is uh, you know like uh, and we know that the distance is 1.5 and the area is there. But since it there is no uh, differentiate part is there. So obviously the contribution uh, from this particular link uh, towards the uh, uh, this uh, strain energy is 0. And simply you see if you are taking the diagonal DE which has the area of A2 we know that we have uh, the direct force in uh, this transfer transformation is there that is the minus 17 by 8P but you see if we differentiate out those terms then it, it, it has to be equal to 0. And then you see the length is obviously 1.7 and the area is there but uh, because of this particular term is absent we have there is no contribution is there in the strain energy from this. So if you look at these uh, mem in individual membrane contribution then you will find that only three uh, contributions are there as far as this F, uh, Fi Li uh, divided by Ai into D of Fi by DQ uh, contribution is there. So now with those particular combinations now we, our main intention is to find it out that what the deflection is at point C. So we know that at point P uh, at point E the load application is there of the 60 kilo Newton. So now we need to replace that part. So you see if you sum up all three components from the table what we have we have the integration of Fi Li over Ai into Df by Dq is 4306P plus 4263Q. So now you see here uh, we know the value of P so we can simply put it those things in those uh, uh, numerical values. So we have the deflection of point C yc is equals to summation of uh, Fi Li divided by Ai into df by dq or we can say that uh, simply you know like we know the uh, value of that. So 1 by E is uh, into you see 4360P plus 4283Q. And you know like uh, since the load Q is not a part of loading because it was a dummy load is there. So we need to keep the Q is equals to 0 because the contribution is coming only from the uh, load P. So within that constraint you see here we have the deflection at point C is equals to you know like the E value is already given as 73 you know like uh, into 10 to the power 9. So you see we, we, we need to replace that part. So YC is equals to which is the deflection at point C uh, due to the responsible load at point P of 60 kN is equals to 1 by 73 into 10 to the power 9 and then you see 4306 was there and P is 60 kN so 60 into 10 to the power cube. So now you see after applying those things we have YC which is 3.539 into 10 to the power minus 3 meter or we can say that the deflection at point C is 3.539 millimeter. So in this calculation you see our main intention is that okay we want to calculate the deflection at the point where the load application is not there. So what we need to do we need to apply you know like a dummy uh, load at that particular point and we, we just assume that under that uh, and under that particular load we have the deflection. So under that particular dum dummy load what we need to do here we need to first of all check it out that how the force transmission is there according to the distance and the load application. 
then we need to figure out that what the relation is there between the actual load and the dummy load and then you see you know like in the Castiglione's theorem it is saying that in all those terms it is df by you know like uh, means the total force with the dummy load is there so what exactly the relation is there in between them so we simply make you know like individual terms that actually how the force transmission is there and which forces are being acting on which member so corresponding to those relations we could easily figure out that okay these are you know like uh, responsible parameters are there through which the force transmission is there and then after getting those things we can simply find out the deflection by summing up those forces with the area and the forces with the relation of the dummy load and then you see in this question also we did the same thing. So you see here, you know, like uh, these two numerical problems are clearly giving you that actually what exactly the application of the Castiglione's theorems are. Because we'll, uh, if you check it out those things, then we'll find that uh, Castiglione's theorems are real, uh, uh, the real applications are there in which the number of load points are there. Just like you see in the previous case where you see the two different kind of loadings are there, the UDL and the point load is there in the cantilever and you see it was pretty simple to calculate those things because you see they have a direct relation with each other. So we can you know like simply uh, make the relations between the point load and the UDL in that particular case and simply find it out the bending moment and the uh, you know like uh, due to point load and the UDL and we simply get the strain energy and once you have the strain energy once you have the load relation you have the deflection at those points. Similarly you see in this stress problem also the the truss problem it is simply that we have a number of various members and we need to calculate that what the force transmission is there when you apply the load at a particular point. So in these cases also you see when the number of loads are there and due to the number of loads the number of deflections have to be there so we need to find out the number of you know like uh, what are the number of key locations and corresponding deflections and then once you get those things you, you have the deflection at the corresponding point. So this is that's why you see you know like the Castiglione's theorem is in a real good application where the number of uh, you know like the points are more and due to the number of load points we have the number of deflections and then we can simply figure out uh, these particular you know like the relations based on the Castiglione's theorems. So this is the real application of the Castiglione's theorems for calculation of uh, this uh, deflection at the different points at respect of uh, the different load conditions. Now you see here you know, like uh, th that th this is what you see you know like in the Castiglione's theorems which we discussed in uh, the various theorems either the first theorem or the second theorem based on the load application as well as the uh, bending moment application for calculation of the strain energy basis. Now you see here uh, this is the last segment of our uh, this course curriculum because you see you know, like uh, we started our journey, journey right from the uh, interaction of the solid object. So as per its name strength of materials or the solid mechanics uh, our main theme was that when you see we have the solid objects and when they are interacting to each other then al always you see we will find that the kind of deformations are there and you see the kind of you know like the force uh, transformations are there or we can say that you see when we are talking about the static or dynamic force then always it has a different picture altogether basis of uh, whether the statistically inter uh, this uh, equilibrium positions are there or the dynamic equilibrium positions are there. So in all these cases you see with the various hypotheses and the assumptions uh, we started our journey with the straight stress part. So the stress is simply defined as you see the force per unit area. But generally you see you know, like uh, we also have the similar kind of uh, parameter which is known as the pressure. But we need to clearly define that what exactly the difference between the pressure and the stress. Because you see if you see the definition then you will find that either the stress or the pressure is force per unit area or Newton per meter square or the Pascal. But stresses are always, the real difference is that the stresses are always being induced in that object by an application of force. So that's what you see it has a great influence where the point of application of force is while the pressure are simply applied part is there. So stresses are always coming out from the object and that's why you see we are generally referred the stresses as the intensity of the resistive forces. And that's what you see we are defining the stresses in the various types. Like you see if you are simply apply the load along you see the axis then we are saying that these are the normal stresses because the normal forces are there towards that. So in the normal stress component we have the two uh, you know like the types were there which we discussed one was the tensile stress one was the compressive stress that means you see if you are elongating you know like any object then you see you know like uh, the kind of resistances which provided by material that was you see the tensile forces so tensile stresses are there and simply when you know like in the axial form only uh, when we are simply compressing those part then we have the compressive stresses. 
So these are the Excel form. But if we have, you see, the normal uh, form is there. That means, you see, you know, like if we are talking about uh, the stresses not in uh, Excel form, but in the plane. Then uh, the other, another, another form is coming <coughs> that is known as the tensile stresses. Uh, this uh, uh, shear stresses that means you see when the uh, the stresses are coming on the circumferential part of an uh, uh, object that means you see when they are taking x and y both axes uh, we can say that if it is taking in a plane then the plane stresses are the shear stresses or we can say that uh, uh, the rotational part when the when we are talking about the shaft then it is the torsional stresses another form which is coming out from the normal stress component is the bending stress so whenever you see we have and that's what you see in general application we'll find that whenever the beam is there and the load application is there always there is a kind of deviation is there the moments are there and we are uh, relating you know like the uh, this uh, intensity of resistive forces within that beam element is uh, the bending stresses within the bending uh, form and then you see within that also when we discussed about that we found that uh, the another form of the stress is uh, the thermal stresses means you see here whenever the change of temperatures are there from the room temperature means if, if either if you are going towards the higher direction more than 100 degrees celsius or even we are going towards the lower direction then we'll find that uh, the, uh, the always the expansion or the contractions are there and the stresses are always being inducing in the object due to the temperature variation and these are known as the thermal stresses so these are five five six types of the stresses were there and these stresses were in, introducing or inducing those objects by the application of force. Then you see the next term which we discussed, which is closely associated with the stress, was the strain. And we also figure out that stress is neither a scalar quantity nor a vector quantity, it is a tensor quantity. So that's what you see, at least the nine independent parameters are required to define the stress component. So that's what you see, irrespective of whether we are going in the normal direction or in the plane direction, always you see, you know, like it is shown by three by three matrix. And that's what you see, you know, like uh, in the transfer quantity, we need the nine independent parameters were there. And that's what, you know, like uh, sometimes when we are defining the stress, uh, it is to be termed out as the tensor stresses are there. And then the another term is the strain part is there which is closely associated with the stress because you see when we apply the load there is a kind of uh, resistance is provided by the material and due to that the stresses are being formed and along with that if any kind of deformation is coming this deformation can be computed with the using of strain co uh, concept. So strain is nothing but equals to as we discussed that actually the change of length or change of any dimension of the object divided by the original dimension. So it is you see here that it is a dimensionless parameter was there. So it is simply you know like measuring that how much deformation can be come up with that particular material under the action of those load. And with these two important quantities in the strength of material, we have you see the real phenomena about the material property. Like you see here, when we have a simple tensile test where you see the load application is there, within the stress and stress component, stress and strain component, now if you draw the stress strain component, we have you see the variety of you know like uh, the properties are there. Like you see, you know like if you are drawing the stress strain diagram for a simple ductile material like high, uh, this uh, mild steel or any high speed steel, high carbon steel or any kind of ductile material. They are, they are exhibiting, you see, the elastic region and the plastic region altogether. And you see here, the clear difference between these two reasons are simply, you know, like judging by the yield point. And then you see, you know, like whatever the energy is being absorbed within the elastic region is always computed with the using of model, uh, this modulus of resilience. And if you are talking about the whole elastic and plastic region, that means you see, if you are talking about the whole energy concept, means how much energy can be absorbed by a material under the stress strain curve, then it is known as the uh, modulus of toughness. So these are, you know, like the closely associated part is there. And in that, you saw, in, in that also, we can simply figure out that uh, the Hooke's, law, uh, Hooke's laws are there and there are variety of parameters are there, which are valid only for the elastic deformation. That means, you see, when we apply the load, the deformation is there. But when we release the load, there is no deformation is there. Means the, it simply regains that part. So within that part, you see, we have uh, it is, this law is known as where the stress is proportional to strain or the elastic region. 
the, the, uh, under that particular law, the Hooke's law is there and within that particular, we have three main coefficients are there. One is the Young's modulus of elasticity, one was there the bulk modulus of elasticity and third one was there the shear modulus of rigidity. And all three are dependent on that what kind of load application is there and what are the influencing stress component is there with the corresponding strain. <coughs> And apart from those things, then we simply discussed about that, you see, when you have the stress and strain, then, you know, like uh, all those types of uh, stresses and all those kinds of applications are there, then we simply find it out whether you see the stress application is there in one directional or it is a biaxial stress, uh, this uh, force action is there or in the triaxial part. So, if it is in the biaxial form is there, that means you see the stress is there in the x component and the y component and also along with that uh, normal stress, we have a shear stress component is there, then the new term is coming as the principal stresses. That means you see we define the new planes or which some stress components were there and these new planes were known as the principal planes uh, where you see there is no shear component was there. So, you see here that means what we have, we have the you know like uh, by simply you know like applying the load on the bound, uh, this outer conditions, we can simply figure out the stress components. But if we want to find it out uh, the stress at the oblique plane, that means you see at the theta somewhere in between that, then also we could simply relate those parts you see uh, by you know like using the various theories. So, that is what you see in the middle of the section, we discussed that actually if the oblique plane is like that, then what exactly the relations are there in the normal stress component, the sigma theta, tau theta at the uh, where the theta you know the location is the oblique plane. So, that is what we discussed and in that you see later part, we discussed that uh, we need to define certain you know like the planes where there is no shear stresses are there and these planes were be, uh, will be in, uh, known as the principal stress component. And then you see the principal stresses which we calculated as sigma 1 and sigma 2 generally if you know, uh, if you know uh, known the, uh, uh, this uh, notations, then you see it is nothing but equals to sigma x plus sigma y by 2 plus minus square root of sigma x minus sigma y by 2 whole square plus uh, tau square x y 4 times of. So, if you see that uh, principal stresses, it has the you know like clear combination of these two normal stresses sigma x and sigma y with this uh, uh, this uh, 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 shear stress component and once you have the principal stress component, the corresponding strains are there which are nothing but the uh, principal strains. We can also figure out straight way the principal stress components, uh, if you know the normal stress component at the oblique plane also uh, with the using of Mohr circle. So, this is the graphical techniques are there, okay, through which we can calculate. If you know the uh, this stresses at normal planes or we can say that the oblique plane, then we can simply find out the sigma 1, sigma 2 or also we can find out that what will be the value of the uh, this uh, maximum shear stress is there sigma 1 minus sigma y by 2 or also we can simply locate the location 10 to theta where you see that uh, these uh, shear stresses are being uh, uh, what is the potential area is there where the shear, maximum shear stresses can come. So, these were the basic formation was there you see about the strength of material then what are the basic components can be introduced in a strength of material to analyze the structure. So, you see uh, we discussed about the various types of stresses, strains corresponding and then the oblique stress, oblique strains are there at the different locations of the theta and then you see we have the principal stresses and principal strains correspondingly and then you see we can simply figure out by analytical method sigma 1 comma sigma 2 or by Mohr circle also, also which is the graphical technique. So, that part we discussed and after that after discussing about the sigma x, sigma y, tau x, y, now we simply went, uh, simply discussed about the bending moment. Means you see, if we have the variety of the beams are there, means you see, you know, like the straight beam is there, the cantilever is there, the simply supported beam is there and you see in, in that also the different combinations are there. Means in the pin joint we have, you see the, some uh, movement is there. So, all those variety of combinations we discussed. And in that you see again the variety is coming on the which, which type of loading is there. If simple point load is there at the extreme end or middle of the beam or anywhere or the UDL is there means the uniformly distributed load is there then what the intensity of the UDL is there or the triangular element is there then what kind of intensity is there and how we can sum up that particular intensity because it is in the triangular one starting from 0 and ending at the maximum. So, how we can uh, you know like just those element how we can take the uniform action of that part and then if we have this kind of triangular element then what will uh, the triangular element of loading is there then how we can figure out. 
So we discussed about the bending moment and the shear force diagram in this chapter that you see you know like the BMD and SFD how we can calculate sometimes you see when the point load is there it is you see the, uh, this uh, uh, straight line terms are there when UDL is there the curved part is there so how you know like the bending moment diagram can be drawn how we can calculate uh, uh, you know like the maximum bending moment at which location it will come so all those blah blah issues which we discussed in that. And corresponding, you see, we discussed about the stresses, bending stresses. That you see, what will be the sigma by uh, sigma by y is equals to m by i is equals to you know like uh, this tau by j. So you see here, bending stresses, you see, which we calculated based on what the bending moment is, and what you see, you know, like uh, the section modulus is there. So what kind of structures are there, and what is the uh, material property is there? So we discussed about you see all almost all types of you know like the cases of uh, bending moment and the stresses. And within the bending moment, we also discuss about the shear force diagram. So shear is also closely associated with the bending because sometimes you see when we are talking about the bending, it is you see a kind, kind of the combined action. So you see here we develop some of the shear, you know, like the theories that what, is, what will be the, you know, like the uh, uh, shear stresses are there and how we can calculate the shear force diagram and all those things uh, along with the torsional part when we, when we were discussing about the shaft. So you see here in all of those either the bending moment and the shear we discuss about the what the deformations are there and what the corresponding you see the stress components are coming within the bending stress or the shear stress. And then next component came with the deflection that if we have you see you know, like uh, the bending action or if we have the shear action alone then what will be the deflection criteria are there. How we can get the deflection by direct integration method, by moment area method or by Macaulay method. So these three methods are very very important you see and they have the individual you know like uh, importance uh, to study for uh, calculating the deflection of any structure. And you see the lastly when we, when we were discussing about the Macaulay method which is quite fast you see simply you know like we need to judge that when the you know like uh, the beam is there in, uh, when the load conditions are there on the beam uh, are different and they have the different segments or the spans are there then you see you, what you need to do you need to simply describe or make a generalized equation uh, within those singularity function and simply apply the boundary condition get the value of deflection and you can also get easily that what is the potential area is there where the maximum deflection can come. So that part we discussed and then you see we discussed about you know like the deflection when the combined loading conditions are there that means you see you know like uh, when we have you know like the couple with the uh, the UDL is there or when we have UDL plus point load is there means you see when the variety of you know like uh, the load conditions are there then how we can get the deflection under those conditions. So this was a real good uh, you know like uh, the applications are there because when we are talking about any beam in you see you know like uh, either our uh, structure the house structure is there or in any of you see you know like uh, the kind of uh, this uh, real uh, civil structures are there always uh, we have you see you know like this kind of load conditions are there the combined load conditions are there and we need to analyze those things accordingly that where which area is the you know like uh, uh, where the maximum deflections are coming what the load conditions are there on those things and like that. So that's what you see this uh, chapter was taken as in a you know like the separate chapter. And then you see we, we were discussing in the last uh, few of the last segments of our course lecture was the strut and the column because generally you see we were uh, we, we have seen that you know like uh, in our houses we have a straight you see the columns and the struts are there so how we can figure out and what will be the buckling load is there what are the influencing parameters were there in that condition so all you know like and what are the different uh, loading conditions are there with those boundary part you see whether it is a rigidly fixed or pin joints or one end is free one end is pin joint like all those blah blah things which we discussed in the bending moment also we discussed the same thing in the column for elastic stability. So you see here we discussed many things in those forms in the strut and column and lastly you see we discussed about the various form of energy which, which is pretty close to uh, closely associated, associated with the you know like uh, the beam uh, this kind of uh, our applications like you see we have the strain energy we have complementary strain energy we have you see the strain energy due to the bending action, the strain energy due to the various other actions like you see the load conditions are there, we have the modulus of resilience, we have the modulus of toughness. So all these forms of uh, the strain energies are very very important and that's what you see you know, like we discussed about uh, these energy formation that what is the domain is there whether it is the shape you know like uh, strain energy is coming due to the shape deviation or whether the strain energy is coming due to the volumetric changes are there.
and then you see in terms of the complementary strain energy or this uh, uh, this elastic uh, this uh, strain energy what is the domain is there means somewhat in the elastic strain energy we had the common domain was you see the strain while you see in the complementary strain energy we had the common domain was the stress so you see here the strain uh, the energy form formation because you see whenever the deformation is there under the load application always store the energy and since you see there is a stiffness a stiffness part is there in that so obviously whatever the energy stored are stored is there it is known as the strain energy formation because of the load application so that's what you see right from uh, our journey started from the stress and uh, and in uh, we finished up to the strain energy with the castig leonov's theorem that you see if you have the different load condition on a structure and you see you know like and all these load conditions are different at different points so we could easily figure out the deflection at the individual point uh, with the using of strain energy concept so del u by del pi will give you uh, the uh, this uh, deflection point or you see del u by del m will give you the angular rotation theta so that was the last part is there so i hope that you enjoyed the whole journey which we started from the stress component that what the stress is there without having a, a least stress in your mind with you see we discussed you know like the many of the numerical problems along with that uh, but you see this subject is always uh, gives you a quite comfortable position because you see whatever the design which you are going to do in civil engineering or in mechanical this is the basic domain for any design because you see until unless if you don't know the basic material property under the load given load conditions then you cannot figure out that what is the factor of safety how much you have to take uh, you have to take and then you see you know like how you can design and what are the real load interactions are there which are coming through the various uh, components of the machine either or the structure part so that's why you see the strength of material is the one of the basic subject of engineering uh, engineering discipline and you know like uh, uh, if you want to be in a comfortable position just try to resolve those uh, uh, physical concept means physics is very very important which is quite associated with the some sort of uh, small mathematics so i i hope you enjoyed this particular subject and uh, i am wishing that actually you know like uh, you will definitely do a good part in later on thank you good day bye bye take care Thank you.